our house was uh, three. Uh, what was it? It was three, four, no, four hats, you know, with a common, you know, and five hats, with a common yard. Mm -hmm. So each mother was a center of her immediate house or hut, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but all of our three students would always meet in a common yard, huh? right? This was part of the architecture of the home. The yard was actually part of the architecture of the, you know, of the home, okay? Uh, and in the evening, we could stream to any of the mother's houses to hear stories, right? So that's how I remember my home. Um, I don't make it romantic, of course there were tensions mm -hmm. with my father and the four wives. But the four mothers, I like to call them, you know, had a kind of solidarity among themselves, which mm -hmm. I found very interesting. At the same time, each mother actually was in control, basically, of her own economy, because the economy of those days was, at least my village, was based on actually working on the land, right? So, that's important. Um, and a few brothers, half-brothers, who had school, you know, but I never thought it was really possible. Until one morning, my mother, Wanjiko Wadiyongo, or Wanjiko Wangugi. You know, our naming sisters are very flexible. Yeah. She could be Wanjiko Wangugi, meaning the daughter of her father, Gogi, or she could be Wajiko Wadiyongo, the wife of her husband, Diyongo. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> You know, our name is Sister Seven, the yeah, relationship as well. Yeah, it was about the confusion yeah, when you went to school yeah, and you called yeah. yourself Mogi or Ajiko. Yeah, right, yeah, right. So, my mother could not, the key thing I tell you is, my mother could not read or write. But she's the one who came and asked me, do you want to go to school? And she, she, she said, I never quite dreamt it was possible for me to go to school. For any only ensure whether we could afford school fees or whatever, or clothes, she's the one who would ask me. What made school attractive to you at that early age? Why no, did you think that somehow... No, I think the dream of, for education was my mother's long before it was mine, right? Okay, okay. Yeah, that's how I like to put it, you know. Uh, of course, we played with the children of, you know, of Kaha who was the landowner. The uh, Lord Reverend. Yeah, right. And so we saw them going to school. So naturally, the idea of going to school may be somewhere in your mind, but since you don't think it's possible, you don't sort of think about it too much as a possibility. So, it's my mother who paid, who went and, as I said, yes, she went and bought me some, uh, no trousers, but uh, shorts and a shirt. Because before that time, I want to make this very clear, the clothes I had was normal, was like just a calico, a sheet under my left armpit with a knot on my, on my left shoulder, you know. It's nothing else, all of us, you know. So when the wind blew, when we were running and the wind blew, the the calico was born by the wind, you know, mm -hmm. and it was right behind us, you know. We, we, we became like, an, uh, in a sense, like an aeroplane, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. uh, with wings. I have shots and a shot for the first time in my entire life mm -hmm. uh, when my mother bought me a pair for school. Uh, my mother, who could not read or write, supervise my homework. But there was the, out there, there was the reality of colonialism that everybody was a victim of in different ways, and your mother did become a real victim of that. And as a child, did you feel the reality of that? Oh yes, I was, 
you know, remember, we're talking about nine, uh, for nine, for seven. Uh, I was born in 1988 under the shadow of the Second World War. When I grew up, you know, I'm seeing Italian prisoners of war and our, our villages, you know, asking for my eye. I'm seeing military lorries, you know, to and fro. And my, one of my half brothers and one of my brothers yeah, was actually in the army, in the police force. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember a day when the military vehicle came to our house, to our compound and hit my mother's heart. Mm -hmm. So it was leaning on one side for a long time, right? So even the Second World War did affect us in some ways. Mm -hmm. Then 1932, Mau Mau War you know, against the British, mm -hmm. or the war led by land and freedom army against the British started. You know, uh, one of my brothers joined the army, the, became a soldier of the land and freedom army, right? You know. Uh, you know, and it's my mother who had to carry all this, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, all this, you know, uh, burden, you know. But my brother, Good Wallace, as he was called, or mm -hmm. Mwangi, as he was called, uh, he was a carpenter. When he went to the mountains to fight, some a soldier, or a mama soldier, you know, fighting for a soldier of the land freedom army. Uh, it was of course a problem for us when we become targets, you know, of your, you know, of the British auxil auxiliary force, otherwise normally popularly known as my home guard, but they were a British auxiliary force. You know, what they call home guard were a British auxiliary force because they were attached to the aims of the Colonial, you know, uh, yeah. colonial, you know, government. So, so and, at that time, mm -hmm. home guards were set up by General Hind, mm -hmm. who was fighting against, you know, uh, soldiers, you know, of land and freedom army, right? Soldiers. So he set up uh, this auxiliary force, you know, uh, either known as home guards, to to divide and conquer, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah. Anyway. We so, become targets of all those forces against us. Let me move you along a little bit faster to, to Alliance, where it is said that at one point during a debate you said that Western education was dangerous for, for, for Africans. Yeah. Is that it a was a motion. No, no. It was a motion where they were debating. I think I remember that. I've written about this actually in, uh, in the House, House of, of Interpreter. Yeah. Interpreter. Yeah. And, um, I don't know, we were debating, uh, I can't really actually tell you, but something like Western education is more, is more of harmful, I mean, I don't have the exact word, okay? And as we were debating it, I remember this very clearly, because I was not really, I was actually in my first year, and I was mesmerized by a debate. Then I could feel, I don't know why it came, but I could feel there's something, I don't know what I felt anyway. So I stood out, I didn't have the words, so I stood up and said, somebody comes to you and he gives you this pencil, and he takes away your land, right? Your pencil, you give land, he gives a pencil, right? So that's the way I was arguing, you know, a pencil for land, you know, education, give them land. Yeah. That must and, be ruffled. And really that better. education was all Western education. Well, no, the motion was not education, but I think West, Western education or something. So I was literally visually given an image of the pencil okay. and land. Yeah. But I was doing it not for any kind of held ideological position. I was looking at the logic of the yeah. 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 Pencil, land. Did it get you in some trouble? No, 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 no. But, but someone advised you that no, you can't. Uh, no, it's much later. Yeah. I think with Ukari Francis, this may have stayed in his mind yeah. because I remember four years later, he tell me, don't be a politician. Yeah? Many people who, who review your work did characterize you as some kind of um, um, 
Uh, Marxist fan, of the, especially after they say after you were exposed to Franz Fanon. No, no, uh, no. Fanon was very poor in my life. Yes, you know, yes, but, yes. Was that someone yeah, who influenced you? Yeah, no, Fanon, the rest of the earth yeah. is still a very important book. And I wish every single, if I had to advise Kenyan, he needs to read one book or activist. It would be Fanon, the rest of the earth. Particularly the chapter called The Fifth Force of national consciousness. If that chapter is so prophetic in so many ways, you know, that although written in the 60s, it speaks to us today. And you know when there were riots in South Africa, when there was South Africans who were fighting against uh, the other Africans and calling foreigners, but no one had taken a lot of us about that. It is that chapter. He said, if you have a vision of an African dream, later it becomes diminished from vision of an African, which is very inclusive, then to continental, then to the nation, then back to ethnic, you know, and then you begin to think of other African people in your own territory as foreigners, you know, and they're fighting against them, you know, as if they were the problem. He was often in a context when you don't have a vision of where you're leading to. You know, when you only see only what is ahead of you, that's when those problems come into being. But when you've got a vision, do what I was saying, when you have a, a vision of where you want to take Africa as a need dependent force in the world, then in that you need every energy of every single African together. Kucha Kulichele, the Manaqueto Nata Ahmed Darwish Kila Sikwa Jumamosi, na Sikwa Jumapili, Wanzia Mwendo wa Samoja Subui, Hadi Mwendo wa Satatu Asubui, Nikuquetia ya kipindi number Moja, Mandaria Wiki. Kipindi ya Mandaria Wiki, Nikipindi ambacho Machu Toko Kimesheni, Makala, Bogudani, Mahojiano, Sana. Na usani kwa jumla Kwa vile kiumu michezo kuigiza Na mambo kadha wa kadha ambayo ya nukusu wewe mtazamaji Na sisi kwa jumla Sisi mbali You can now watch this program on ADN Channel 5 He brought you life-changing stories right into your living room. And the story of Budalangi. He traveled across continents. In Atlanta. In Accra. Ghana. In Botato. Maliland. Kigali. Tiki. Interviewed heads of state. Yes, thank you, son, Alex. On governance and human development. Complete stories that add value to your life. A CNN fellow. A production for breeding their cattle. A food security fellow of Oklahoma State University. Yes, this was the mode in Hargeza. We take you to the rural areas of Rwanda. Over 15 years experience in television reporting. So peaceful here, so different. And now... A game changer. People from Kenya are a good man. A compelling weekly issue oriented show about you and with you. Every Thursday at 8 p.m. only on KTN News. You can now watch this program on ADN Channel 5. Did you, do you consider yourself to be or to have been a Marxist. Let me tell you a secret. Well, not a secret, really. Capitalists all over the world are more Marxian than many people who they understand what Karl Marx was talking about. That's why they know what he's talking about, and they try every possible way, by every means possible, to make the writing not seem relevant. Are you an, uh, an admirer uh, no, of no, Marx's no, writing? No, I, read, I, I still read a lot of Marx, you know, read, um, writing and so on. But I want to come to the essence. 
My work in reality emphasizes working people. The small farmer, the working and prosperity, the producer, correct? Yeah, but, but that is the very philosophical underpinnings of uh, people who take a more Marxist leaning. I mean, because it, is, it, is, it no, became yeah. an ideological issue no, in no, the no, world no. when the bipolarity of the world was real in, in, in the no, 60s no, no, and no, no, in the 70s. Let me forget. The first real communism in the world was Christian communism. And you have to read about the Acts of the Apostles, right? Where Ananias is some or other has explodes or is scars because the Christian commune in you know, shared everything. They depend on each other on sharing because they were under siege from the powers that be, right? So the idea of sharing is there in our community. What I'm saying is, Marx is very important, but they are workers and producers of wealth long before Marx was born. But what is, is articulate very clearly the question, the logic of capitalism as a way of organizing wealth. And the, his whole story and opinion of his is is not just for in general, but under the capitalist system, you know, the worker and the owner of capital, labor and capital. Now, show me a factory anywhere in the world where there's no labor and the owner of that capital. Whether he clearly, he clearly, what do you say? He clearly delineates. Look for two positions. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Christianity. We see, for example, you're writing. What I'm talking about is people are like a labor is easier to deal with than the reality. You know. I also want to talk. To, okay. Are you talking about working people? I'll say yes. Are you talking about uh, the fact that uh, they are homeless people? I'll say yes. I talk about that they are landless, I would say yes. I talk about the jobless, I say yes. I say I am, that we can have a, another way of organizing society, I would say yes. Now, you labor it one way, not you, I mean, what you can say, oh, that's very Christian. If that's what you want to call us, it's fine. Or oh, Marxian, I call it, that's fine. As long as we go to the realities. Uh, but your writings have been influenced in some way a lot by, by Christianity, is it not? Sure, but I mean, not, but that's, that's only me a Christian. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not saying that. The uh, point I'm driving here, if you look at uh, a grain of wheat, for example, there is a concept like that in, in, in the Gospels. There's also the devil on the cross, which takes a more satirical approach. Because, I mean, people don't talk about the devil on the cross, they talk about... Jesus, for example, on the cross. Where did you get to this point? Uh, where about that, I find that very interesting. Because the cross used to be, or it still is, used even now, for I don't know if you know, where these and are desirable, they were hung. And Jesus was hung there as a criminal. Not, no, be very careful. I don't think he was a criminal, but they, the power that he treated him like a common, you know, criminal, yes. you know, meaning, but I want to say he was, don't get on to be very clear, I want to say he was a criminal, I want to say the whole point of crucifying him on the cross, <laughs> right, was because he was treated like that, right, what any other person would be treated, and you remember, in the cross there is another people who are hung beside him, you know, on the left and the right, you know, okay? So, if you think, I use a symbolism, what I was thinking, is a, uh, is a devil who should have been on that cross, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the devil should have been on that cross, you know, right? That was, I was trying to make people think more fundamentally. So to what extent you know? would you say then that uh, the, the, the Christian environment that you saw around you when you were growing sort of informed certain... Oh yes, it's part of me. I mean, whether I don't... I'm not a Christian, let me be that clear. 
but whether I'm Christian or not a Christian, that environment is for me. I tell you my the first text we I read when I learned the Koyo, how to read your language, was the Old Testament. A translation of the Old Testament in Koyo. And this is my book of stories every day. I used to, you know, whether I go in the field or whatever I want, you know, I'm, my companions were people like uh, people like David, uh, Saul, I you know David, and Goliath, and you know, and uh, Samuel, and Daniel, and you know, uh, and Exodus, you know, uh, and Jonah in the whale, in the tummy of the of fish, and being vomited out. I mean, for a child reading, it's magical world, literally, you know, for me, you know, you know. so the Bible. Is a very integral part of me. Uh, just like, so, but, just, but in just, this, just in like this, the reading of Mark. But, but in these titles, you don't necessarily talk about Christianity in flattering terms. I mean, for example, the devil, there's a certain irony around it, or perhaps a certain perceived hypocrisy of the people who profess that that that, that faith no, at that time. Yeah, yeah, because there's been so much distortion. Not just Christianity, by the way. It's just the you see, the whole conception of the human life is spirituality. Spirituality is what makes us different from animal world. You know. the, the human strives for the spiritual in a way. You know, uh, you the, the ethical dimension of the human is a strife for the spiritual equality of life, you know, which is higher and above that one of just material and animal existence, okay? And in many religions, whether African religions, Christian or Islam or Buddhism, in a way, try to cater for that spirituality. The difference comes is this, as many religions, whether Islam, Christianity or any other, they later come to believe that the ritual itself how to replace the spirituality. Okay, let me yeah, get right? to one final point yeah. before we wind this. Uh, but this is very important. Yes. Can you let me finish this okay. one? Just let me say, you know. But, uh, but I'm, making, I'm saying, many religions have strangled spirituality out of religion. And what remains are rituals. Okay. You know? I, I, I get your point. So let's talk about language as the last point because um, over the years, you began advocating that the devil and the cross was originally shaitani, uh, and, and, and you've written quite a number of things in Kikuyu, and you have this belief that somehow language is a very important uh, transmitter of culture, and therefore you think that language determines how people think. Uh, I want to understand at a philosophical level, because that's where you seem to take it, why language is so important, how you reconcile that with the fact that language is so dynamic, it's changing. Right now there are people who don't even know what their first language is. Ah, that, but that's the whole point. Uh, again, I realized when I was in prison, I, I was coming to prison. But, but, but you write that book in prison, by the way. Yeah, I was in prison. And I'll tell you why. In prison, by the way, if I went to prison because of writing the play, Guy Gardner in his Quran. Yeah, and it was assumed at the time that I should have been applauded. <laughs> I just think, oh, here it's not just me. Here intellectuals from the University of Nairobi going to work with the regular people, right? Uh, and without pay, without any personal reward in terms of material personal reward and so on. But I was put in the committee maximum security prison for it, okay. Uh, true, I also worked with the underground movement, like, you know, the December 12th movement. Uh, and that, and when, in a replaceable atmosphere, you can never, you can never, a human must never give up the right to organize. Any more than human give up the right to their language. Anyway, I'm put in prison for a year uh, and there I started thinking, why is it I have been put in prison for writing this play, Eating a Crow, 
where I, I deleted the seminar theme in English without the seminar repercussion, right? So I started thinking about the languages when, when I was in the committee, and I realized whenever one people have oppressed another people, the first thing they do is impose their language on that people. In history, talk of the English conquest of Ireland, the truth language. So what about now when languages are so mixed? Probably some of your grandchildren are getting married to people that don't I'll speak. To that, you know, you know, the uh, Scottish people were um, conquered through English, English language, you know. Uh, for us, what am I advocating in Kenya and Africa as a whole is mother tongue for every child. In our case, Kiswahili for every child. So mother tongue will differ. If you are Luo, Luo, Giko, Koyo, then Kiswahili, and then English. And you can add all the other all. Or the, I normally put it this way. Let me put it because it's more sensitive. If you, uh, no matter who you are, if you know all the languages of the world and you don't know your mother tongue, that's uh, enslavement. No, we don't come into that. Let's first see what is enslavement. Enslavement is when you don't know your mother tongue and you know all the languages of the world. Enslavement. But if you know your mother tongue and add all the other languages of the world to it, that's empowerment. If we establish that as a fact, first of all, not as a as a necessity, then we come to the complex questions of what about you know a child who does not live, you know, you know, you know, you know, or mixed marriages. First of all, mixed marriages are even better. If you as parents Say you are Luo, that one is a Kikuyu. Is a, is a, say assuming that the mother is Kikuyu and the father is Luo. I'm just giving that example. The new, the father with Luo speaks to a child in Luo. The mother will teach Jesus the child in Kikuyu, and the child will be speaking both languages naturally. English language or whatever is the language of power they will pick in schools anyway, right? Or Kiswahili. They will pick in schools automatically. If it's a, even if it's an African male who has married a, a white or an European, they will do the same thing. Father speaks to her in, in the language of his own language. And the mother, the other language, Okay, we, we, have, we have to finish this. You have been okay. urged recently that you should come back to Kenya. Some people think you can't be talking about this language thing and you live in the white man's land. What's your response? Uh, people forget, first of all, two things. People forget that I, I was forced into exile. I, didn't, I never chose exile. Two, when my wife and I returned to Kenya, I was 20 years of exile. And our plan was to be six months in Kenya, six months abroad. What happened? We were attacked by armed gunmen. Okay. Now, I can see quite honestly that now the democratic space, the democratic space, is wider, is widening, and all I can do is see what I can do to work. I'm prepared to work with all the other progressive forces in this country to help move the country forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.